everybody. <clears throat> Stand back. It's feeding time. What? Surprisingly, this isn't the most terrifying thing in this film. Hey everyone, I just watched Artemis Fowl and it was... Artemis Fowl. <laughs> oh god. Yes, Disney has pulled a Netflix and dumped an absolute stinker of an original. Currently sitting at 3.7 on IMDb, my mind is still processing what I just watched. Now, if you've been around my channel before, like and subscribe if you haven't, you'll know I like to take popular shows and films with terrible endings and rewrite them. But Artemis Fowl deserves a complete rewrite, like page one. So in this video, I'm going to outline what made this film so bad and ways to go about fixing it. Disclaimer, I have not read the Artemis Fowl books, so this video will just be focusing on plot points in the movie. First things first, Artemis Fowl is an adaptation and adaptations are notoriously tough to write. How do you remain faithful to a book while simultaneously trying to tell its story within the medium of an hour and a half movie? I mean, if we literally tried to fit all of Lord of the Rings in a movie, 80% of it would be descriptions of landscapes. And the snow flowed down the dim shapes of lofty clouds. mountains. <laughs> With adaptations, you have to be able to adapt. That means cutting or adding characters, moving scenes around, or completely adding new scenes in order to make the story fit the medium of film. So that being said, let's get into my first point, the beginning. Beginnings are arguably the most important part of a movie. They set up the characters, bring us into their world, and tell us what the story is really about. In a world where there's so much TV and movie options, if we aren't hooked in the first few minutes, people will just move on to the next thing. In this section, I'm going to focus on the first 10 minutes. And Artemis Fowl has a terrible beginning that squanders those few precious opening minutes. <laughs> The first 3 minutes and 45 seconds are all about how the world is searching for Artemis Fowl Sr. He's wanted in connection with a bunch of world famous treasures which have gone missing. 3 minutes and 45 seconds are wasted on a plot point that has almost no bearing on the overall story. We don't even find out what happened to these artifacts at the end of the movie. The next minute and 15 seconds are shots of our protagonist, Artemis Fowl Jr., surfing. Again, this doesn't advance the plot at all, nor does it set up anything about the character that pays off later. I thought for sure there would be a scene later on in the film where he has to get on some sort of surfing device and utilize this skill, but nope, this entire waste of precious time has no payoff later in the film. The next two minutes involve a meeting with Artemis and his therapist, Dr. Poe, a character who is completely inconsequential and who we'll never see again. The point of this scene is twofold, to show that Artemis is an arrogant know-it-all and for us, the viewer, to understand what his major character flaw is. Is. The problem is that I know the textbook reply to any question you may choose to ask. The problem is that you don't respect anyone enough to treat them as an equal. But by having Dr. Poe tell us this, the movie is going against one of the basic rules of screenwriting. Show, don't tell. We, the viewer, nor Artemis the character, should be told what his flaw is. We want to see it. So what if I told you to scrap these first 10 minutes altogether and we could create a scene that tells us all about who Artemis is as a character while simultaneously moving the plot forward and making us care about him? Uh -uh, no way. Now, just be warned, I came up with this in like 10 minutes and these Disney writers have many months, so bear with me if you think it's not up to snuff. I'd start right off the bat with Artemis at school. It's a huge science fair, and Artemis has with him a giant robot Lego thing that's clearly superior to those of his classmates. We've seen in the actual movie that Artemis is really into this stuff, and it also sets him up as being brilliant. He goes around telling the other kids how they could have made improvements to their projects, but he just comes off as arrogant and a know-it-all. This ticks off some of the other students who bully him, pushing him into his giant project, completely shattering it to pieces as his fellow classmates stand around and laugh at him. This entire scene is pretty basic and can run about a minute and a half, but it accomplishes everything and more than the actual version did in 10. We now understand that Artemis is smart, good at building and innovation. We see his flaw is his arrogance, and that he's alone and has no friends. I'm now more invested in him as a character 
because I feel his pain. I empathize with him. And best of all, this is all done through showing, not telling. The first few minutes is all about setting up our protagonist's character arc, so that over the course of this journey, we'll see him change from an arrogant know-it-all who is picked on at school to a humble hero with the courage to take on the bad guys. The next scene could be Dr. Poe or the principal trying to get in touch with Artemis's father after this bullying incident, but he's not around. In fact, Artemis Sr. is almost never there. And this leads me to my second big rewrite note. There's almost no character development between the characters. When you have no development between the characters, you get scenes which lack an emotional punch or just plain don't make sense. For example, three quarters of the way through the movie, Artemis's butler, Domovoy, is killed. Aside from training, we never see Artemis and him have a real moment together. What makes their bond so special? Was he around when his father wasn't, making him kind of a pseudo-father-like figure to him? Imagine how much more powerful this scene would be if we truly felt how much Dom's death would mean to Artemis, how special their connection was. Another example is the relationship between the fairy, Holly Short, and Artemis. Are we friends? Artemis Fowl? We are forever friends. This scene is completely hollow because we haven't seen these two become friends. They haven't bonded at all. In fact, Artemis has kept Holly trapped in his home for three quarters of the movie as his prisoner. Note number three, the villain is terrible and boring. There's not much we know about the villain known as Opal Koboy, other than she's a brilliant bad fairy who wants revenge. At least, I think it's a she. The entire movie, all she does is brood in her lair. She basically does nothing the entire film. Film. The best villains are ones that think they're not evil, that they're the ones in the right. Her motivation is just revenge, so I'd write her to be more proactive and give her some sort of personal motivation to justify her want to take over the world. Maybe her family was killed by humans and she believes that fairies taking over would result in a more peaceful world. But the fact her face is hidden the entire time, and again I haven't read the books, leads me to believe she is likely Artemis's mother, hence why they have to hide it. Note number four. What the hell is the Aculos? It takes 36 minutes for us to find out what this thing is. The fairies want it, the villain wants it, Artemis wants it, but for much of the movie, I don't even know what it does. The first mention of its power comes at that 36 minute point, and we find out it's an object of unimaginable power that can give its wielder the greatest spells in fairy lore and the ability to teleport whole armies and wipe out life. That detail should have been explained way earlier, as it it would give Holly and the fairies huge stakes and motivation to find it. If they don't, it could mean the destruction of humanity, and if the wrong person gets their hands on it, who knows what unimaginable calamities could happen. Note number five, setup and payoff. As I previously stated with Artemis's surfing, which was never paid off, there are many instances where things aren't set up. For example, Artemis talks about how his dad used to recite this Irish blessing. This comes up several times throughout the film, like when Artemis deduces that that his father's secret journal is hiding in a book that contains this blessing, and later when Artemis recites it to a dying Domovoy. We should have seen Artemis's father recite this to him if it's that important. Instead, it's another instance of telling us instead of showing us. Another example of a payoff with no setup happens around the end of the film when Artemis talks to the villain. Just who do you think you are? I'm Artemis Fowl. I'm a criminal mastermind. A criminal mastermind? I don't think I've seen this character do one criminal thing this entire film. I mean, I guess you could say he locked up Holly, but he was doing that for good reasons. Note number six, irrelevant characters. Remember Juliet, Domovoy's niece? You could take her out of the story and literally nothing would change. Having extra characters just muddies everything and all Juliet does is give people meals and quip a sentence here and there. The fact that she's Dom's niece also has no bearing on the story whatsoever. Then there's Briar Cudgeon. We first see him in jail and somehow Opal has the power to get him out and he's suddenly in a higher position than the commander. He apparently reports to some sort of executive branch but we never see them and we also never learn how he got in jail in the first place and how no one questions how he got back. I think you could take this character out and not much of the story would change. Note number seven, Mulch Diggums. Other than the absolutely terrifying CGI of him dislocating his jaw, 
Mulch's character isn't that relatable because it takes us too long to establish a connection with him. A whopping 55 minutes into the film, he says this. Please, I just, I just want to be small. I just want to be normal like the rest of my kind. This should have been expressed crystal clear in the first scene with him. Yeah, we see him in line with his quote unquote own people and learn how he's different from them, but we don't get a sense that he wants to be like them. If Mulch wants to be short, his character arc should be that by the end of the film, he realizes that his size makes him unique and that he ultimately embraces what made him different. And he kind of does this in one extreme wide shot, which seems like a line added in post. Host? Is giganticus! Yes, he just kinda yells Dwarfus Giganticus, and that's all we really get. A mark of a good story is seeing characters with a flaw go through a journey and change because of it, and I didn't get that feeling with any of the characters. The setups often didn't have any payoffs, or the payoffs didn't have any setups. So there isn't any magic solution that will save this movie. We can't simply move a scene around or change some dialogue since this film has so many problems. As I stated in the beginning, this is a page one rewrite, but what we can do is identify its problems and build from it. We establish our characters' flaws so we can see how they grow throughout the film, make sure they develop deep emotional connections with one another, have a villain whose motivations are deeper, and that actually does something to get what they want. So Disney, I'm here baby, I'm really cheap. I'll give your script a read and even toss in a free Think Story mug. That's as much as I can talk about Artemis Fowl before my brain explodes, but thank you for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes, follow me on Twitter at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.